She was a pretty wild cat. Touch me and you won't live till morning. My heart was gone when I saw her. She was one of the world's most celebrated beauties. She didn't think she was a sex symbol, but Frank thought so. Men fell at her famously bare feet, but none brought Ava Gardner lasting happiness. She was searching for that one person and always ended up with the wrong guy. On screen, she was an unapproachable goddess. But when the cameras stopped rolling, no film star was more down to earth than Ava Gardner, whose dramatic screen roles paled in comparison with her own passionate life. She really had a life that seemed to people to be very much a movie star's life. Romances with glamorous people, tempestuous marriages, passion, Spain, gypsies, drinking. Ava Gardner. A great beauty, unfulfilled love, always searching for the love that was just out of reach. Ava Lavinia Gardner was born on Christmas Eve 1922 in a North Carolina town so small it wasn't even on the map. Grabtown was nothing more than the farmhouse in which Ava was born. A few tenant, small tenant houses a cotton gin, and a tiny little church. She was the baby of the family. She had four older sisters and an older brother when she was born. Her mother was 39, so Ava was quite a midlife surprise. Ava's father was a poor tenant farmer who worked hard to bring up his six children. Ava's house had no indoor plumbing, so in modern standards, they were, might be considered poor, but they were certainly rich in love of a close family. She was very, very loved and uh, probably spoiled. She was mischievous and she was outside all the time and she loved to be barefooted. At home, Ava repaid her parents' affection with strict obedience. But with friends, the feisty tomboy loved to swear, chew tobacco, and take on any dare, regardless of the danger. She would climb the water tower by the Brogdon School, and, and she was a daredevil. She had many playmates. One of them that she adored was a little black boy named Shine. They worked in the tobacco fields together, and she was always colorblind and would become very defensive of anyone who tried to mistreat her little playmate. But Ava's happy childhood was blighted when fire destroyed the family's farm. The penniless gardeners left North Carolina for Virginia, where Ava's mother found work as a cook. Meanwhile, her father's health was deteriorating, and in 1938, he died at the age of 59. The 15-year-old and her family were forced to move again, but wherever Ava went, the warm-hearted teenager soon made friends. She'd come to stay with me at my house, and she always liked to ride the school bus. And when she got off the school bus, she'd put her shoes in our mailbox. She loved going barefoot. And when I stayed with her, her mother always tucked us both in and kissed us goodnight. But Ava was growing up, and her protective mother laid down the law when it came to boys. Ava came home with a young man one night, and he gave her a kiss on the porch. Well, pretty soon the door opened, and kabang, slam, here came Mrs. Gardner. Ava had one crush that her mother didn't discourage. Both of them adored Clark Gable and the other film stars whose performances offered escape from their humdrum lives. You talk too much, but you're a cute little trick of that. I think her fantasies for herself were more about being a big band singer. She always wanted to sing, and people who led the big bands were big romantic stars, like Nardi Shaw. Ava also had more realistic goals. She intended to become a secretary, then marry and achieve her ultimate dream of motherhood. Every chance she got to go see a baby 
anywhere near. She went and wanted to hold it and play with it. She was my babysitter. She had the greatest maternalist instinct I think I've ever seen for a person that didn't have a child. She'd get down on the floor with him and play all the sorts of little games. And, and she always was available if I wanted her to babysit. Now, there was no money exchange. She just did it because she wanted to, because she just loved him so much. In 1940, the 17-year-old achieved good marks on a secretarial course at nearby Atlantic Christian College. But Ava's life was about to take a dramatic turn. She went up to New York to visit her sister, Bappy, the sister she was closest to. She'd never been to New York before. She was very excited. Uh, Bappy was married to a photographer, and he took her picture. She had on a big picture hat. It was a little, uh, looked a little like Scarlett O'Hara because Gone with the Wind had just come out that year. He put the picture in the window of his photography shop, and someone from MGM saw the picture and asked her to test. MGM was the most successful and powerful film studio in the world, home to more stars than were in the heavens, according to studio publicity. During her New York screen test, the astonished Ava could barely speak. When she did, the MGM talent scout could barely understand. Her accent was so thick they couldn't understand a word she said. So they said, just forget that, just walk back and forth. So it was a silent test, but based on her beauty, she was offered an MGM contract. For Ava, a studio contract and a wage of $50 a week seemed an amazing once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But her ailing mother was fiercely opposed. So Bappy said, this is her great chance. I'll go with her and make sure everything's okay. And so they boarded a train for Hollywood. It turned her life upside down. It was almost as if she was transported to another planet. The number one quality they wanted in contract actors at MGM was malleability. And they wanted people who did not resist being changed. Ava had a, you know, have language lessons, diction lessons, her hair was changed. They did everything they could to her, apart from surgery, to make her look like what they thought a star should look like. And one of the side effects, which was not intended, was that it made her feel inferior. Maybe she wasn't talented, maybe she wasn't good enough. It made her feel like there was something wrong with the real her if everyone wanted to change everything about her. The tobacco farmer's daughter from North Carolina was awed and intimidated by the luxury of the MGM system. We would have limousines taking us from stage to stage. Ava couldn't believe her luck in landing a contract with MGM where she was being treated like a star. She was very co cooperative. We did photographic sessions. We had to pose in cheesecake, and uh, she would put up with it because it was part of being groomed for a star. The 18-year-old's remarkable beauty turned heads even at MGM. Among those mesmerized was the studio's number one star, 20-year-old Mickey Rooney. They were taking her around the lot and seeing uh, what was being filmed, and he was doing a comedy scene where he was dressed like Carmen Miranda. She came onto the set, and I went, bang. It was just incredible. She was a beautiful lady, and I asked her for a phone number, and she said, no, and I said, please, and she said, well, all right, you can call me. So I called her, and I asked her out, uh, for dinner and she said, no, I don't want to go out with you. Bappy advised Ava, make him work for it. Don't give in right away. We had dinner and four more dates and five more dates. And then I asked her to marry me. Ava was also not wanting to do anything that her mother wouldn't approve of. But Mickey Rooney was very persistent and they, he ended up actually marrying her, though they needed Louis B. Mayer's permission. Sooner or later, the studio, Ava, and uh, they all gave in, and we were married in Ballard, California. Just Ava and my mother, and her mother, and 1,400 press agents. <laughs> Ava 
Stephen and I would like to thank everybody for their many good wishes, and especially our boss, Mr. Louis B. Mayer. Thank you very much. Within a year, Ava Gardner had gone from total obscurity to being the wife of one of the world's most famous men. 19-year-old Ava would have preferred to stay at home and start a family, but MGM had hired her to work. In 1942, she nervously began her apprenticeship with a string of small roles in B-movies. In 1943, MGM loaned Ava to low-budget monogram pictures for the slapstick comedy Ghosts on the Loose, starring Leo Gorsi, Hunts Hall and Bella Lugosi. We're not going out there tonight anyway. Not going to our new house, but Jack, why not? I thought we'd take a little trip first. You know, a honeymoon. I hope you don't mind, darling. Oh, no, darling. Anything you want to do is all right with me. <laughs> you got lipstick all over you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Once she was walking around past a neighborhood theater and Ghosts on the Loose was on the marquee and it said Ghosts on the Loose starring Ava Gardner. She said it was the first and last time she kind of got a thrill out of being a movie star. That rush of, boy, now I'm there. But Ava had little confidence in her talents as an actress, an opinion no one could overturn. Ava never thought that she was a very good actress. She never gave herself credit for being a good actress. But if Ava was insecure about acting, she wasn't shy about facing problems at home. After one year, her marriage to Mickey Rooney was in trouble. She went into marriage thinking it would be somewhat like her parents' marriage. She wanted to stay home and cook fried chicken for Mickey. He wanted to go out partying. She had a temper, and uh, if we'd go out and I'd look at anybody or say hello, she'd leave the table, and I couldn't find her. She was convinced that he was not faithful, and so she filed for divorce. I'm sure that Ava tried her best and I tried my best, but it just didn't work out. And it, uh, it was very sad. For Ava, her decision to divorce was an admission of failure. Then her self-confidence was further damaged by the death from cancer of her beloved mother. My grandmother died on that same day Ava's divorce came through, and it was a very, very sad time for her. Molly had been her rock all through the years, and it was a devastating blow to her. After losing both her parents, Ava felt even more out of place amid the tinsel of Hollywood. She tried to hide her insecurity with alcohol. Having a glass of champagne or vodka would relax her fears of insecurity. When she walked into a room, she would feel so insecure that she would feel like crawling under the rug until she got to the other side of the room. Drinking calmed her nerves before going before the camera. And so she continued to drink, especially in times when she had so many heartaches. But Ava wasn't afraid to stand up to unwanted admirers, even if they inspired fear in others. The most persistent was billionaire aviator and film producer Howard Hughes, who became obsessed with the gorgeous starlet. Howard Hughes was like the man who came to dinner in Ava's life. He just would never go away. He had all the money in the world at his disposal, but they never had any kind of real relationship. Howard Hughes pursued her off and on for 20 years, and Ava said she never really cared that much for Howard. They had big fights. She hit him on the head after one argument with an enormous bell and knocked him out. And according to her, was so angry at him that uh, she would have killed him if someone hadn't stopped her. Hughes fought a losing battle. 23-year-old Ava was in love with another charismatic celebrity, band leader Artie Shaw. was the equivalent of a rock star. Ava grew up loving his music. Ava seemed to like very confident men. He was very self-confident. 
34-year-old Shaw had already been married four times. His past wives included Lana Turner, Ava's friend. The band leader wasn't ready for another marriage, so this time the increasingly independent Ava began a passionate romance without a wedding ring. Artie and Ava secretly moved in together, an act that could have destroyed her career, until, in 1945, they tied the knot. That same year, the struggling actress was loaned to Universal Pictures for an intriguing film noir based on a story by Ernest Hemingway. In The Killers, Gardner played an irresistible femme fatale who double-crosses an adoring thief played by Burt Lancaster in his film debut. Jake tells me you're a fighter. Do you like the fights? I'm afraid I've never seen one. No kidding. I hate brutality, Mr. Anderson. The idea of two men beating each other to a pulp makes me ill. The Killers was a key film for her. Uh, she's talked about it as the first film that she really enjoyed acting in. She played a very beautiful, very glamorous character. For the first time, she just really blew people away with the way she looked. You know why Colfax hates you? Because of me. He's no fool. He sees what's happened. Why did you ever go back to him, Kitty? Maybe because I hate him. I'm poison sweet to myself and everybody around me. I'd be afraid to go with anyone I love for the harm I do them. She more or less had a romance with the camera. She just related to the camera so well, very calmly and uh, from most any angle. You're not meeting them tomorrow. All right. Released in 1946, The Killers was a critical and commercial hit, and its success made MGM realize that 24-year-old Ava Gardner had the makings of a star. Although Ava Gardner had grabbed Hollywood's attention with her performance in The Killers, the actress's home life was again in turmoil. She felt dominated and intellectually intimidated by her husband, Artie Shaw, despite her best efforts at self-education. He insisted that she begin reading all these classic books, but still she felt like she did not come up to his, uh, his level at all, and that was very disappointing for her. He caught her reading a book called Forever Amber, which was a big bestseller at the time. You know, he wanted her reading Schopenhauer or God knows what, so he threw Forever Amber across the room. Uh, the coda to that story is that after he divorced Ava, he married the writer of Forever Amber. In 1946, Shaw stunned his Ava by asking for a divorce. It was one of the most painful periods in her life. But as Gardner faced another heartbreak, she also began one of her most enduring friendships. Maureen Jordan entered Ava's world as housekeeper and assistant. We just hit it off like that. She was like my sister. When I went in for the interview, she said, you know how to make martini. And I said, Martini? No. And she said, well, I can show you. And from then on, I was in. Within a year, Ava's life was getting back on track. In 1947, she was amazed to be cast opposite her childhood idol, Clark Gable, in the big-budget romantic comedy, The Hucksters. You could be a lot of help to a guy like me, couldn't you? Mm, in what way? Oh, in a business way, eventually. Want a secretary, Mr. Norman? How's your short end? Some people like it. MGM now considered Ava ready for stardom. In one touch of Venus, she literally became a screen goddess, playing Venus to Robert Walker's love-struck mortal. Come here to me, close to me. Just look at her, the most beautiful girl in Hollywood, with the perfect figure and face. Ava Gardner, in One Touch of Venus. The romantic thriller The Bribe paired Ava with heartthrob Robert Taylor. Their on-screen passion continued in private, despite Taylor's marriage to Barbara Stanwyck. But it was Ava's next affair that made headlines around the world. 
Gardner had first met Frank Sinatra when she was married to Mickey Rooney. By 1949, Ava was twice divorced, and the married Sinatra had plummeted from superstar to a near has-been. Frank's career was pretty much rock bottom. He could barely get a nightclub engagement. At that time, Frank was having an affair with Lana Turner, and Ava and Lana were good friends. Lana said, Frank will never marry anybody because Nancy has him sold up said, he's had me dingling all this time. Although the Catholic singer vowed he would never leave his wife, Frank and Ava began a wild and reckless affair. And when they were spotted at a Houston nightclub, even MGM couldn't control the storm that followed. Ava received hostile and threatening letters, branding her a homewrecker. The nature of the two people made a lot of headlines. They were both rambunctious, <laughs> both um, dynamite, and both highly emotional. You put two sticks of dynamite together and you get an explosion. I blatantly asked her, are you sure you love that guy? He's so skinny. <laughs> And she assured me that she loved him very deeply, and I think she always did. She was the love of his life, and he was the love of her life. And I once said, what about Nancy, Frank? And he said, oh, I'll always love Nancy because she's the mother of my children. And he did love Nancy, but Ava was the great love of his life. In 1950, 27-year-old Ava Gardner received the most challenging role of her career so far. She was cast as an alcoholic singer in MGM's lavish film of the Broadway musical Showboat. It co-starred Catherine Grayson, Howard Keel, and Marge and Gower Champion, and it featured one of America's most popular music scores. Doing Showboat, we had such fun. She was, she was so fun, she had a great sense of humor. Full of hell, and, and a great gal to be with. She was open to anything, swore, all the, all the time, almost as much as me. And we'd sit and have a little tequila now and then. Mr. Mayor said, no drinking on the set. So they said, Katie, can we keep the booze in your dressing room? And often I couldn't get in because they were drinking the tequila and having their own parties. They wouldn't come out. So we had all the locks changed. And Ava stopped, stop. She said, you little SOB, you've changed all the locks. You give me my booze. <laughs> So I did. But despite her drinking, Ava also worked hard and she was eager to sing Showboat's famous songs. Frank had coached her extremely well and she sounded wonderful. And today there would be no question that it would be her own voice. But in those days, each department wanted perfection. She knew she wasn't the world's greatest singer, but she felt she could do a good job. And by all reports, she did do a solid job. But the people at MGM, they said, not good enough. When they dubbed her singing in. I gotta love one man till I die. That was, I think, a personal disappointment. Singing was what she had fantasized about more than acting. As a compromise, Ava's singing voice was used on Showboat's original soundtrack album. That man of Although the film was a huge hit, MGM's rejection of her vocals further undercut Ava's sense of self-worth. I said, Ava, you're a wonderful actress. She said, I can't act for sour grapes. I said, you can act, you're a fine actress. And she said, I know what I am and what I'm not. But Ava's spirit was lifted by good news. Frank and Nancy Sinatra had agreed to divorce, and in 1951, Gardner was thrilled to marry for the third time. She was convinced that this marriage would last. Her happiness was evident on the set of her next film. <laughs> the snows of Kilimanjaro paired Gardner with Gregory Peck in Ernest Hemingway's story of a tragic love affair. Please. I'm Cynthia. 
Cynthia, Cynthia Green. Sin, that's nice. When did you come in? No minutes ago. I'll be happy. Ava, as a performer, to be it was unique. I think that um, she had deep passion, which we know, and uh, she was able to show that, but show it naturally. Darling, there's a war going on. There's a war going on here, too, right here at this table. There's a dandy little war going on. Darling, you shouldn't drink too much. No, no. I shouldn't do a lot of things too much. I shouldn't love you too much. I'm awfully bad for you. She was encased with this gift of sensuality. Will you be kind to me? I think I'm a little afraid of you. The Gumbo, the new word in motion picture entertainment. The following year, MGM sent Ava to Africa to co-star once again with Clark Gable in Magambo. I warn you, I'm looking, I'm searching, I really am. I'll look with you for a little while. Where she kind of allowed herself to kind of have fun with the part to bring more of a personality into it where she just kind of felt all oh, the hell with it. You know, this is the way I am. Ava's earthy performance inspired her best reviews to date and her only Oscar nomination for Best Actress. But Gardner remained insecure about her abilities. After a year of marriage to Frank Sinatra, she was becoming unhappy. She wanted a family. And the sad thing is that it almost happened. She got pregnant with her husband with the man she loved, Frank Sinatra, and it just didn't seem right to her. His career wasn't quite where it should have been. Frank was traveling a lot. It just didn't feel like it was the, the time was right for her to have children. So after they finished Mogambo, after they wrapped, she went to London and had an abortion. By making the decision on her own, Ava had taken a great risk in the relationship. When Sinatra found out about the abortion, he was furious. Their marriage was also collapsing under the weight of their common weakness, jealousy. People were always looking at them, they were always looking at people. The other one would say, why are you looking at that person? Why are you looking at that person? They had a fight. She hears a gunshot from his room. What he had done, apparently, was fire a gunshot into the mattress with the aim of upsetting her. And this enraged her even more. She had Howard Hughes with secret detectives following Frank and bringing in these reports showing them to Ava what Frank's doing. So that didn't help. In 1953, Ava used her star power to get Sinatra an audition for the big budget drama From Here to Eternity. Frank got the part and won an Oscar, reviving his career. I'm, I'm deeply thrilled and, and very moved. And I really, really don't know what to say. Ava wanted him to succeed, but his success just seemed to unavoidably add another stress to their lives. They had too many career demands. They were too jealous. The world's press wouldn't leave them alone. After less than two years of marriage, Sinatra and Gardner announced their separation in 1953. The divorce was finalized in 1957, but the bonds between them were never completely broken. Frank, she told me, was her one true love. They couldn't live together, and they couldn't live without each other, and that was the problem. They were too much alike. In 1953, 30-year-old Ava Gardner escaped the heartache of her third failed marriage by traveling to Rome. She was there to film The Barefoot Contessa, co-starring Humphrey Bogart and written and directed by Oscar winner Joseph L. Mankiewicz. Ava strongly identified with the story of a woman who goes from poverty to big screen celebrity and through a string of unhappy love affairs. Where are you, Maria? Half in the dirt and half out. Oh, um, but it hasn't been good for you. Oh, in many ways, it's been beyond my dreams like a fairy tale of this century. A lot of people thought that my father was taking a big chance by, by casting her, even though she was a big star. 
she had a, a, a reputation of being two parts star and one part actress, but she was absolutely wonderful in the part. The Barefoot Contessa will shock you, provoke you, excite you as no motion picture before it ever has. She understood the yearnings, men going crazy over her because she was beautiful, but her beauty in a sense almost being a trap that made her life more unhappy. They all worshipped the face, the fame, the figure of the world's most beautiful animal. I remember her as being the most direct person in the world. And she said, who wants to go to the movies tonight? Nobody did. And she said, Bogey he said, no, I'm just going to let us And she turned to me and she said, you want to go to the movies, Tom? I'm 12 years old. I turned the color of a Coke machine. And she said, let's go. I'll have a car pick you up at 7. I couldn't believe it. I said to my father, Ava Gardner wants to take me to the movies. I was in heaven. Ava was eager to build a new life far from the glare of Hollywood. Spain became her home, a place where her passion for living could be indulged to the fullest. She came into her own in Spain. It was pretty heady stuff. This was a place that she would move to. Number one, to get away from Frank, and to have a new life in Spain. And of course, the bullfighters helped. Ava was a person that loved the nightlife, too. And so Spain, everything was open at night. The first night we got there, uh, she just wanted to show us the town. And we went everywhere, uh, all to the flamenco places. And she even danced with some of the flamenco dancers. And I said, I got to go home and go to bed. And she just, she just kept on going. She would go to the lowest dive and drink all night with the peasants. It didn't matter to her. Once we went to the mountains and we found some gypsies in this cave and we stayed in those caves two nights, just dancing, drinking wine. Ava embarked on a torrid affair with famed bullfighter Luis Miguel Dominguin. She also spent time with her friend Ernest Hemingway, who was pleased when Ava starred in the 1957 film of his novel, The Sun Also Rises. The actress was perfectly cast in the part of Lady Brett Ashley, an aristocratic beauty with a taste for alcohol, bullfights and bullfighters. I'd like another brandy, please. Camarero, dos panderos, por favor. Will you finish telling my fortune? Of course. But it might take a little while. Since you say I will live so long, I have time. Financially secure and approaching her 40th birthday, Ava chose to make fewer films. Most, like the dramas On the Beach and 55 Days at Peking, were filmed far from America. The further Gardner was from Hollywood, the more confident she felt as an actress. She was getting to an age where playing Women of the World was what people wanted to cast her at, and she enjoyed those roles. Women who'd been around, who understood what life was like. She relaxed more in the roles. You're a hustler, a fantastic, cool hustler. Ava loved The Night of the Iguana, based on Tennessee Williams' play, and co-starring Richard Burton and Deborah Carr. Will Mr. Shannon be all right, do you think? All right? Honey, I don't know. Director John Houston shared Gardner's passion for the good life, and the Mexican beach location offered plenty of opportunities for fun. She liked water ski, and I think they would sometimes have to go by small boat from one place to another, and she would water ski over. Night of the Iguana, I really saw Ava and her personality in this. She became a little bit proud of Ava for a change. She was always putting herself down and said she wasn't an actress, but I think she finally realized she was. But Gardner's hard-won self-confidence was about to be shaken by the most volatile relationship of her life. The Italian epic, The Bible, directed by John Huston, 
paired 42-year-old Ava with actor George C. Scott. Wife. Abram. My husband. During production, the two became lovers. But according to Ava and others, passion turned to violence. They were both people with tempers, and they were both heavy drinkers, and there were several occasions where he really hit her very hard. John Houston, he said, really be careful, the man I think is a killer. He would just drink a fifth of vodka and go all the way crazy. She did most of that film in a body brace. He had broken her shoulder and injured her ribs in her back. She felt in danger of her life where she really felt this guy was gonna kill her. He talked her into going to Connecticut. I hadn't heard from her in over a day. I thought, oh my God, I called Frank Sinatra and I was just hysterical. And he said, Rainey, don't worry, I will take care of it. About two and a half hours later, she walked in the door. Somebody went down and got her. But she was so beaten up and bruised in that time, it was terrible. After a decade of drinking, partying and men, 46-year-old Ava Gardner said goodbye to Spain and began a more sedate life in London. But by 1972, as she entered her 50s, life was increasingly lonely. She loved her dogs very dearly. They were her children. That's what she told me once. They're my babies. To have had a family, she often said that that would have been her first choice, but it was not in the cards for her, and so she made the best of what she had. Gardner knew that good film roles were scarce for women in their 50s. She chose to act only when she needed money or to work with friends like John Huston, director of the 1972 Western, The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean. Is that a bullet hole through my heart? Yes, it is, ma'am. They was wild men in those days. Who did it? Snake River Rufus Kyle did that, I believe. Yeah. Yep. In 1974, Ava appeared alongside Charlton Heston in Earthquake, a disaster movie slammed by critics, but successful at the box office. There's no boy, I'll need help too. I've got to try and find him. Is she more important than me? I want this train stopped. Ava knew that films like The Cassandra Crossing and The Blue Bird were second rate. Most were roles that she did as she expressed it, just for the loot, honey, just for the loot. Ava preferred to relax in London or kick off her shoes with family and friends in her native North Carolina. One day, my daddy, who was in his late 70s at the time, he asked, how does it feel to be so rich and famous? And Ava smiled as she looked at him and she said, hi, ah, Sheffy, I'm just an old broad, gets her picture taken a lot. In 1985, the veteran actress took a guest role on the primetime soap opera, Knots Landing. Despite Ava's nervousness, she was a hit. Now you're ready, Gregory. You were brought up to be powerful, and you love it, and you want it. How do you know what I want? Because you like me, too. And you know as well as I do. Power, Gregory, real power. You love it. The cast just fell in love with Ava and begged her to make it a permanent role. But she said, look, she had no idea those actors had to work that hard. She was 62 years old, and it was just way more work than she wanted to do at that point in life. Ava did agree to appear in a TV pilot entitled Maggie, starring her friend Stephanie Powers. But after filming, Gardner suffered a stroke, which cost her the use of her left arm. Depressed and frustrated, the fiercely independent actress struggled to regain a normal life. Once we were walking in the park, and I realized she was weak, so she sat against the tree. I sat down beside her, which was a big mistake because one couldn't help the other at that point. She was dead weight, and I was too, but anyhow, 
she started laughing and she said, Rini, did you ever think that it would come to this? And I said, no, never thought. She said, I didn't either. She said, this is a bitch, isn't it? I said, yeah, it's a bitch. I called Ava and she said, I'm a mess. I don't want to live any longer. I just want to say goodbye to you. You've been a real friend and kept all of our secrets. And I appreciate that and I love you. Goodbye. And I, I was in tears. On the 25th of January, 1990, one month after her 67th birthday, Ava Gardner died in London of pneumonia. Four days later, she was buried in North Carolina beside her parents. She always said she wanted to come back home and be buried with mom and daddy. Ava is, is back home with the family. One floral display at her funeral bore a simple note, with my love, Francis. North Carolina has never forgotten Ava Gardner. In the 1980s, a local museum was opened in her honor. She did go to the museum. On her last visit home, it was locked and she could not get in. And someone that was with her said, we'll get a key and let you see what's in there. And she said, I don't have to go in. I know what's there, I lived it. Ava Gardner was a person who never completely felt that the success she had was deserved. If this movie star stuff hadn't happened, she might actually have been happier. But she took life for what it was and she appreciated the ironies. She was the most breathtaking, honest, funny person that you were a little bit in awe of, but you could conceive of as being a real pal. We were sisters. And I remember her as a fine person who loved life as long as it was worth living. Being married to Ava Gardner was one of the most memorable moments of my life, and I wish her well wherever she is. Ava had a great zest for life. A lot of people go through this world, and they exist. Truly, my friend, I can tell you that Ava Gardner lived. At nine, Viggo Mortensen, but next, a pioneer, a billionaire industrialist and a film mogul. Did Howard Hughes really have it all, or was there something missing? Mm -hmm.